The Lord be with you. My name is Jennifer Brown, and I serve here as the pastor of University Baptist Church. It's my joy to welcome you to worship this morning. We're so grateful that you're with us. If you are a guest or a visitor looking to connect more deeply, there is a card in your pew back. You are welcome to fill out and drop off in one of the offering boxes in the front or in the welcome area back there, um, and that will allow me to reach out to you personally and hopefully um, talk more about the church and what's going on in your life. We take up our offering by using those offering boxes, and so you can give there or you can give online. You may not know this, but our church budget year runs March to March, and so now we're here at the end of our budget year, and so if you've not had an opportunity to give, I'd encourage you to do so. So your giving to our budget enables us to do all of the wonderful ministries that we do, all of the community outreach, um, and continue to be a light for Christ in the world. So if you've not given, this is a great season and opportunity to do that. We are continuing our Lenten study on the clearing season, and so if you haven't been with us, you're welcome to join us. Potluck is 545, study gets going about 630. Our children's choir has also resumed, and so if you have a kiddo who would be interested, there's no auditions or anything like that, um, but Ian would be happy to have them in choir, and so we hope you'll join um, for that. And then our next college fellowship, we try to do this about once a month, will be um, at, the ho- at the home of the Hicks. And so if you need that address, um, just let me or the church office know, and we'll be happy to connect you there. So with all of that, let's take a moment to center ourselves on the Spirit of God among us as we prepare to enter worship and listen to our prelude together. morning, please join me in the call to worship. On our worst days, God God is good. On our best days, God God is good. When life is consistent, God God is good. good. And when life turns on its head, God God is good. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, God God is good. God is here. God is love. Hold tight to that good news. Let us worship God. 
please stand and join us in singing hymn number 631, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Please join me in the call to confession. There's a moment in our scripture today when Jesus turns to Peter, named the Rock of the Church, and says, get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you all, but that's a pretty bad day for Peter. It's a pretty bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. Fortunately, this absurd moment comforts me with the knowledge that even Peter made mistakes. Peter, who was given the keys to heaven, Peter, Jesus' right hand made mistakes, just like me. And still, Jesus chose him. Knowing that, let us speak honestly with God. For even on our worst days, we belong to God. And that will never change. Join me in prayer. Holy God, we often find ourselves moving through a world that does not make sense. Like Peter, we want to yell out, this should not happen. We want to control scenarios beyond our reach. We want to hold your world in our hands. Forgive us for the moments when we lead with declarations instead of curiosity. Forgive us for arguing when we could listen. Forgive us for fixating on one truth when we could open ourselves up to many. So often, part the edges and teach us how to listen. With hope in our hearts we pray, amen.
Friends, no matter how many times you have dug your heels in, no matter, how, no matter how many fights you have wanted to pick with God, no matter how many times you have disagreed, raged, or clung to what you know instead of embracing holy change, we worship a God of grace. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not even a stubborn attitude or a tense heart. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Pour water into the baptismal font as you speak the following lines. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> God's love for us will always be deeper than we can imagine. We are seen, we are loved, and we are forgiven. Now follow Peter and go be with the church in the world. Amen. Please bow your head and join me in the invocation. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence among us this morning. You are a good and merciful God. Whether we come from a place of joy or from the depths of heartache this morning, as we join together in fellowship, help us all listen and worship with grateful hearts. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Psalm, chapter 107, verse 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. I will be reading from the New King James Version, but you can find the reading in your pew Bible on pages 551 and 552. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice their sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God.
I'll invite the children forward at this time for our story for all ages. You are the first one to come. Thank you. I'm the first one to come. So I thought I would read our scripture today, and it's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So our Bible says that we're supposed to be imitators of God. God wants us to be like God. But before we talk more about imitating God, I I think we should maybe practice what it means to imitate a certain thing. Are you all ready? Okay, so if we were going to imitate a bunny, what would you do? A bunny rabbit. Can you show me? What do they they hop? They hop? Yes, yeah, that's great. If you're going to imitate a bird, what would you do? They fly, right? Right? If you were going to imitate a lion, what would you do? That was a good roar. Roar. Yeah, that's right. If you were going to imitate a cat, what would you do? Meow. Yeah. Or you could just ignore people. Meow. Yeah. So as I was watching, I could tell what you were imitating based off your facial expression and how you moved. And so God wants us to imitate God. And so I was wondering, what are some things that God would say if we're imitating God? What What is something God would say? Maybe that, that we should love one another, right? Maybe God would say that we're supposed to tell the truth. That seems like something God would say. What are some things that God would do? Do you know what God would do? Yeah. God could fly. That, that is a good point. But, but God listens to our prayers, right? God loves us no matter what. Those are some things. And so God tells us about God's love in the Bible, and we can imitate God and tell others. And so God cares for us by giving us family and friends and our church. And so we can imitate God by treating other people with kindness. Okay? And so if we're going to remember this, I want us to say these three words. Always imitate God. Can you say that? Always imitate God. Yep, that's what we're going to try to do today. So we're going to imitate God today by saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. So if you know it, you can say it with me, okay? We're going to say it together. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all so much. You may go back to your seats. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. You can follow along in your pew Bible on page 1,164. I am reading from the NRSV. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. 
Thanks be to God. You'll excuse me, I have notes today, actually. I'm a little bit on the struggle bus with our time change here. And so I was um, thinking about some of the books that I read last year. And one of them was by um, a child actor named Jeanette McCurdy. And some of y'all may have listened to it. She narrates it herself. She was a child star on Nickelodeon on a show called iCarly. And so throughout the book, she is exploring the relationship with her mother because it's a provocative title, I'm Glad My Mom Died. It's not something you really say in polite company. And so as she takes you through her journey, you begin to understand that her mom had a dream, a dream for her little girl to be a star. And she was willing to do anything to make that possible, from teaching Jeanette how to cry on cue to giving Jeanette her first diet and helping her develop an eating disorder so she could stay small. No action was too far for her little girl to become a star. Never mind the fact that she never wanted to be a star. She did not want to be an actor. She told her mother repeatedly that she wanted to be a writer. But this mismatch of the mom's expectations of what she should be overrode who she actually is. And it was only after her mom died that she began to unpack everything that had been done, all of the expectations that had been put on her, that she began to understand really that that relationship was abusive and took advantage of her. It was a hard truth. But when she finally came to it, she was able to do what she had always wanted, which is to write. And so she wrote her memoir and became a New York Times best-selling author right out of the gate. And she continues to write today. This passage passage in scripture is similar to Jeanette's book in the fact that Peter has very mismatched expectations for who Jesus is going to be. And, And Peter wants to mold Jesus into something else. And he's willing to do it in nefarious means as long as he can get to the Jesus that he wants to see, the Messiah that he desires. And so last week, just a few verses up, we have this wonderful exchange where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter gets it right. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he takes a breath and Jesus explains that this is going to be suffering. And then Peter puts his foot in his mouth. Okay, like very rapidly, all right? And so in one moment, Peter is the rock upon which Christ is going to build the church. And in the next moment, Peter is now the stumbling block, the pebble on the ground, the uneven stone that is leading to Satan. It's a pretty drastic flip within a few verses. And so today I want to kind of dwell in these verses, kind of figure out what they mean for us. It's a super Baptist sermon, you know, because there's only three verses. There's a lot here. So we're going to kind of go verse by verse. And so from that time on, right after Peter's declaration, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering. And this was not the expectation of a Messiah. A Messiah had long been prophesied, a Messiah that would come from the line of David. But those folks were thinking of a political Messiah. They wanted someone to overthrow the oppressive Roman government. They wanted someone to rule. They wanted somebody with power. They wanted somebody to issue judgment on their behalf that they could ride into war next to and be proud of. They wanted a macho Messiah. That's what they wanted. And so when Peter starts hearing this, this conversation that Jesus is having about suffering and, and, and being uh, killed at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, he can't fathom it. That's not the, the Jesus that he wants. In fact, he wants Jesus to give those folks their comeuppance, right? He wants those folks to be put in their place by the Messiah. He's just declared who Jesus is. 
but his own expectations blind him to who Jesus actually is. He understands the title, but not the person. And I think we've all had those moments in our life where people's expectations of us blinded them to who we actually are. It's kind of a a trope in coming-of-age films where the football player secretly wants to be a poet or the nerdy girl really wants to dance, right? And then there's this big reveal at the end where finally everybody sees them doing that thing and the parents see them and they're, and they're so proud. And, and we live for that resolution because we all connect with wanting to be seen for who we are and not people's expectations of us. And so Peter pulls Jesus aside. And I will say, Peter gets this right. Peter does not shame Jesus in front of the group. So Peter is still doing something correct here, okay? He's not calling him out in front of everybody, right? He pulls him aside, but then Peter rebukes God's son, which can you imagine? I cannot, but Peter does it. Peter's like, don't talk that way. Do You don't have to do that. And Jesus' response is harsh, or maybe. Maybe it's not as harsh as we think it is. And so Peter, Peter says, God forbid it, Lord. Surely not you. Don't do that. And then Jesus turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And the Greek there, get behind me, is the same Greek that in chapter 4, verse 19 we describe as follow me. It's the exact same. And so on one hand, this may be truly a rebuke. You could argue that way. But I think more than that, I think it's actually a further invitation. Follow me, Peter. Get behind me. Follow me to where I'm going. Jesus is constantly trying to get him to follow him, even though he knows at this point it's going to lead to the cross. That's what he lays out in the next verses. And so he says this, get behind me, follow me. And then, of course, there's that word, Satan. Jesus calls Peter Satan, or the accuser. And it harkens back to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, when Satan tempted Jesus with worldly power. If you will but bow to me, I will give you every kingdom on this earth, the accuser offers Jesus. And I think in some ways, Jesus' words come across harsh here or passionate here, because I think Jesus is actually tempted. We believe that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And so that means that Jesus had to be tempted by the idea of power, or at least the idea of not having to suffer. No one wants to pick suffering. And so this temptation that Jesus has already faced and already said no to comes back up again. And I think that's true in our lives. There are temptations that we battle through that we say no to, and then all of a sudden, out of left field, even from a friend, maybe, They pop up again. And so Jesus has to do the hard work again of saying no to something that I think at his base level he would have wanted not to suffer. But the other good news here is that Jesus is not condemning Peter. Did you catch that? Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus is calling out the accuser's influence in Peter's life, rather than condemning Peter himself. And I think that helps me because we all have tendencies to want things that we should not, whether it's power or influence or security or money. But those desires do not condemn us. Instead, Jesus calls those desires out of us, saying that they are not of him, of God, Those can be reformed out. And so Peter then is judged to be a stumbling block because you are setting your mind on divine things, or not divine things, but on human things. 
And I spent a lot of time thinking, well, what does this mean? Because I was raised pretty conservatively, I would say. And so we, we only listen to kind of Christian radio, right, to keep our mind on the divine things, CCM, wow, worship. We didn't watch any sort of movies that, that weren't appropriate or had too much violence. My mom never let us have toy water guns because that was violence, you know. And so my parents made a lot of decisions to try to keep our mind focused on God, to try to keep whatever is true and whatever is beautiful, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, right, as the Apostle Paul says. But I think divine things are more than just squeaky, clean, Christian, branded things. I think divine things at its core means faithfulness. And so Peter is being called to faithfulness. And Peter doesn't want faithfulness. He wants something else. He wants survival, And I think one of the biggest temptations in our culture is the temptation to want things to survive, to preserve institutions and people and power, rather than to be faithful. I'm reminded of the example of Julie Royce. Some of you may know her. She writes the Royce Report. And so it's an online blog dedicated to keeping the church accountable. She has a degree in journalism, but she didn't start off with that calling, with that vocation. She actually worked for the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. She was a really popular programmer. Her theology aligned with theirs, which is pretty conservative. But the further up she got in the organization, the more corrupt she realized it actually was. And people kept telling her not to talk about it because it would hurt the witness. It would hurt Moody. It would hurt the church. And at some point, she decided she could either preserve the status quo or she could be faithful to her calling. And that's what she picked. In 2018, she lost her job. She lost friends. She lost relationships. But she went public with the corruption. And so they cleaned house. They had to fire some top executives. They had to get more transparent with their funding. And honestly, they're a better organization because she stepped forward. She picked faithfulness over survival. But it's a really, really hard thing to do, to say that I love something so much, it's okay if it doesn't make it. One of my mentors in ministry once called this holy indifference. And I was like, what? How can indifference be holy? holy. And their point was, if you hold on to something too tightly, that line between loving something and making an idol of it is really, really thin. And if we want to be faithful, we have to understand that following Jesus is more than just preserving the status quo or keeping an institution, a church, a seminary, a college alive. Our call to faithfulness means simply following Christ. And sometimes that is uncomfortable. Sometimes it is painful. Sometimes it requires us actually risking something. But here's the thing. Every time when someone picks faithfulness over survival, in the long term, it pays off. It creates health and wellness and growth. That's what we're called to. And so this week, I hope as you continue your Lenten journeys, you continue your practices, however you're clearing out your heart for God in preparation for Easter, I hope that you will remember that we are called to be faithful.
As we move into a time of response and invitation, I'll invite you to offer your prayers and praises to God. If you would like to officially make UBC your church family, you're welcome to do so during this time or become a follower of Christ yourself. Join us in standing and singing hymn number 493, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. I'll invite you to hear an open-eyed benediction and then remain standing for our choral benediction. May God grant you grace. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to know now that the world is too dangerous for anything but the truth and too small for anything but love. 